I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed by you. How you love me. Will you sing it and worship with us today? despite us despite my failures despite my weaknesses despite my inadequacies despite all the things I've done wrong he still loves me like a father that loves his children amen he loves us he loves us amen Glad to be in the house of the Lord this Sunday morning. It's been beautiful this past week. Amen. Now, some of you folks were here Wednesday night. You heard me murmuring and complaining because of how humid, muggy, and see, the Lord, He loves me. Because thirsty, it dropped below 60. And I rejoice. Now I know some of you just didn't rejoice. And the Lord will give you the rest of the year. Just let me have a few days. I, I, I appreciate the Lord and all His goodness. Do you appreciate the Lord and all His goodness today? Hallelujah. Amen. I want you to turn with me to the book of Genesis. The sixth chapter and... 14th verse and while you're doing so if you see somebody around you that's new would you just reach over and welcome them to Peace Tabernacle we're so glad to have each of our visitors and guests here today we're thankful that you came to worship with us and we pray amen that you will not make this your only visit but you'll come back and just become a part of our family amen and that is our heart's desire today to see the family of God just continue to grow Amen. And to reach those in need. Amen. I want you to know that we are in a time of our church where God is establishing some things. And He is going to, you're going to see some things that you may question. But I want you to know this morning, I'm going to go ahead and give my title before I give a text. God always has a plan. God always has a plan. Amen. And so, there are times when you may not understand everything, but it's not for you to understand. It's for you to just pray and trust and believe. Amen. Praise God. Genesis, the sixth chapter, the 14th verse. The Lord spoke to Noah in this text, and he said, Make thee an ark of gopher wood room shall thou make in the ark and shall pitch it within and without with pitch and this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of the length of the ark shall be 300 cubits the breadth of it 50 cubits and the height of it 30 cubits a window shall thou make to the ark and in a cubit shall thou finish it above and the door of the ark shall thou set in the side thereof with lower second and third stories shalt thou make it god gave noah a blueprint he gave noah a plan of salvation of salvation and when Noah obeyed that plan of salvation, Noah saved he and his family. 
I want you to know today God has a plan for Peace Tabernacle. God has a plan for your life. And we're going to talk about that today. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity to once again come into this house of worship to fill this pulpit to preach thy word. And I ask, Lord, that you would anoint these lips of clay. Anoint every ear to hear, Lord. Bring understanding to our mind that we might grow closer to you. And in this, I will give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. Can somebody say, in Jesus' name? I'll say it like you mean it. Say, in Jesus' name. You can be seated this morning. God bless you. I tell you, when you say the name of Jesus, you need to say it with authority. Hello? Bishop McLean, he taught us that years ago, that you got, when you speak that name, it's got authority in it, and you need to speak it with authority. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, the devil's not intimidated by someone that doesn't act like they know what they're praying about. I'm just going to meddle here at the beginning. I even, but you know what? When you speak with authority, the name of Jesus, there's a confidence and a knowing that he will answer my prayer. That devil, you don't have dominion in my life. I will control you. You won't control me. Hallelujah. But I want to tell someone this morning, the Lord always has a plan. He's not surprised by the activities that go on. In fact, sometimes he sees to it that they fit within his plan. It's a very sad day that we experienced in the nation of France this week. Several hundred, amen, I believe it was 162 uh, that the current count have lost their life because of hate, bitterness. Anger. It's a shame in this day and age that, amen, with all of our knowledge and with all of our understanding that we still can't get along. Oh, I'm going to preach this morning. <laughs> it's a shame in the hour we live in after overcoming so much, uh, amen, that there's still prejudice, amen, rampant in the world today among all races. It, re, prejudice is not a white thing. Uh, it's not a brown thing. It's a, a, not a black thing. It's a people thing. And it's surely not a God thing. I don't know about you, but this old time religion I got makes me love everybody. I don't care where you come from. I don't care what you used to be. Uh, hey Amen. I love you for who God made you. Amen. I don't agree with sin. I don't agree with sin on anybody. Hallelujah. But I believe everybody can be saved. I believe God can save an Arab person just like he can a Chinese person. He can save somebody from Trinidad just like he can save somebody from Montana. God is no respecter of persons. Hallelujah. And he has a plan today. He knows exactly what he is doing he is not surprised by the actions of men God had a plan when he created the heavens and the earth God had a plan when he told Noah how to build the ark God had a plan when he told Abraham to get up out of the land of Ur God had a plan when he told Moses how to build the tabernacle. God had a plan when the first coming of Jesus Christ, uh, and I got news for you, he has a plan for his second coming, uh, and it will come to pass. Yeah. Hallelujah. Well, you're not with me yet, but I pray you get with me before we're done. Let me just make this point clear this morning. If anything has been ordained of the Lord... There is a plan attached to it. The Lord doesn't do things haphazardly. He doesn't just say, well, you know, I think, uh, you know, uh, I'll build a church in Wharton. No. He has had a plan and a blueprint for Peace Tabernacle from day one. Amen. He had an order in line from day one. He believes in decency and in order. 
Some of y'all trying to stay with me and some of y'all don't know where I'm going, but just hear me this morning. God knows what he's going to do in our church. He knows the souls that are going to be saved. He knows where we're going to be five years from now, ten years from now. If he should tarry, he knows. He's not caught off guard by us. He knows who's going to be sitting on the pew. Hello. See, with a blueprint that the Lord designs, he knows exactly who and what he wants to accomplish his plans. I can prove it scripturally. Exodus, the third, 31st chapter, the first verse. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in, in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in cutting of stones to set them and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. And I, behold, I have given with him Ahaliab, the son of Ashmimach, of the tribe of Dan, and in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted, I have put wisdom that they may make all that I have commanded thee, the tabernacle of the congregation, and the ark of the testimony, and the mercy seat that is thereupon, and all the furniture of the tabernacle. Before God ever gave the blueprint to Moses, he already knew who he was going to use to build the, every piece of furniture. He knew who the craftsmen were going to be. He appointed the leadership of the building of the tabernacle. He let Moses know this is who's going to do it because I have given them the ability to do it. I want you to know God never sets up a plan without knowing who and what is going to happen. God understood when he built this church the who's and the what's that were going to be a part of it. He understood every time something would go wrong. He understood, amen, that there's a plan in effect and we've got to work the plan. Hello? You've got to work the plan. You've got to work the blueprint. The problem is a lot of times people try to get away from working the blueprint. They want to do it their way. Oh, I'm going to preach this morning now. I'm feeling good. Hallelujah. Brother Bacchus, you've been in construction. I've been in construction all my life. I know how to read a blueprint. That's something you need to learn how to do. You need to learn how to read a blueprint. You got to learn what all them little symbols are. One of the things I did when I worked in the secular field is... I did takeoffs. Electrical contractor bring me this thing and he's too lazy to do it himself. Huh? Hey, can you do takeoff for me, man? I'm, I got too much going on. No, you don't. You just don't want to do it. <laughs> so I'd sit down and I'd go down this whole list of material and I'd begin to do a takeoff. The engineer designed it according to every specification that was given to him. And so now, I'm telling you, well, you got to get this, and 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 you got to get this. And so you say, we're going to supply all this. But there's always that one person. I don't care what the blueprint says. I'm going to do it my way. But wait, the engineer who went to school, who studied, who learned all about the physics and the geometry and all that stuff that I didn't want to take time to learn, he said we got to do it this way. Well, I, that's not the way I do things. You don't have to use a 2 by 12 there. We can just use a 2 by 4 It'll hold. Y'all men are laughing because a lot of you men know what I'm talking about. There's always that one. We don't have to dig three foot down. We'll just dig two. Wait. 
Specs call for a three-foot hole. Because they've done a test on the ground, and if we only go two foot, it's not going to last. It won't hold. you got to go three. But we're going to shortcut. You see, when you start shortcutting the plan, it affects the future. It may not affect when it's done. But the plan is designed so when the structure is built, when the wind comes, it's going to stand. When we have catastrophes that happen in New Orleans and in other places, Galveston, you know, what's the first thing that's questioned? The design of the structure. The design of the jetty. Well, you know, if they'd have done this instead of doing this, and, and, and you know, it, it was said that, uh, you know, you should have done this, but they want to, Cut the corners. Save the cost. And you know, it's not so much different in your spiritual life. You cannot shortcut the blueprint. You cannot do it your way. You have to. God knows who is going to be in the blueprint and what's going to be in the blueprint. He knows what he has designed to be accomplished. Amen. The Lord makes it plain. I have a plan, and I know who I want to execute the plan. Hallelujah. Amen. God doesn't have any problem, amen, putting together a plan and putting people in charge of the plan. Moses had a speech impediment, but it was he who was called to fulfill God's plan. It wasn't Aaron. It wasn't Miriam. It wasn't Korah. It was Moses. Mr. Stuttering Moses. Because God could trust him. Hallelujah. You know, God knows who he wants to implement, implement the plan. He knows who he wants to lead. Amen. The design of the plan. Amen. And too many times... Uh, we think we don't have to go by the plan. Woo! What's wrong with you, Cora? Well, I'm as spiritual as Moses is. I don't think we ought to go this way. I don't think we ought to do it. I don't believe it takes all that. I don't think Moses is the man anymore. I, I'm a leader in the church, too. I'm just as good as he is. I'm going to tell somebody, and I feel this very strongly this morning. You better be careful when you start saying, I'm just as good as the man of God. I'm, I, I'm, Brother Bumgarner's not trying to set himself up on a pedestal. I'm just a saint fulfilling the office of a preacher. Amen, this morning. I'm not trying to say I'm Lord of anybody. I'm here by the grace of God. But I do understand the order of God and the blueprint of God. And when God puts a man in, in a position or in an office, I respect it. I don't start questioning him. I mean, God gave us a plan to fulfill, and that's to reach the lost. We've got to do that, church. Korah's problem was, is he said, my plan's better than the plan Moses is over. I can lead the children of Israel to prosperity. You better stop listening to that line, devil. Amen. Miriam and Aaron, amen, you know, they had a part to play. They had a position to fulfill in God's plan. But it's when they tried to usurp God's order, God's plan, that God let them know I have a plan and an order and I've got a man to operate it and I don't need you to interfere with it. You know what he did? He put her outside the camp. She had leprosy. And if it hadn't been for the man of God that God had appointed saying, would you have mercy? Would you have forgiveness? Would you let her be healed? Hey, man, she'd have never been touched. Uh, but thank God for a compassionate man of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Can I tell you something this morning? I know I'm called to Pastor Peace Tabernacle. I know I'm in order of the plan. I don't need any help. Now, I don't want to sound arrogant when I say this. I love the men that minister with me. 
And I'm going to teach and preach and lead them as best I can. But I'm going to be honest, Brother Staines, I don't need help from my ministry team and how to pastor. If there's something going on in the church, pastor can handle it. I don't need another minister to come up here and try to pastor for me. Now, some of you may not like that. Some of you may not. And you can go tell them, anybody that's not here, you can tell them I said it. I'm not afraid. I'm not intimidated. I'm a man of God. I know where I stand. I know where I live. And I love the Lord. And if there's situations going on, I'll handle it. That's the problem with Korah and Miriam and Aaron. Moses ain't doing nothing about it. Moses ain't handling his business. You know what? If you'll let the pastor be the pastor and you be the saint, uh, we'll get along a lot better. You say, what are you trying to say, Brother Bumgarner? The problem with a lot of people is, is because I don't make our business public. Because I don't go around embarrassing people. Because I try to handle things quietly and in order. Well, he must not be doing nothing about it. Why don't you try to get spiritual for once in your life? You know, I try to do everything with prayer. Lots and lots and lots of prayer. I just believe it like this, Brother Staines. The more I pray, the more I give God an opportunity to help folks. Because he can do more than five seconds than I can do in five minutes of talking. I can do more damage in two minutes of talking. And I care about God's saints. I told somebody in our church this morning, my father taught me, the word of God says, touch not mine anointed. Now, there's a lot of preachers, and I love them, but they're wrong. Because they take that scripture, and they say, it's just about us. We're the anointed. Dude, you're an afterthought. The anointed is the body of Christ. Every child of God that's been filled with the Holy Ghost, they're anointed, and I want to be very careful how I handle anybody that's of the body of Christ. Why did you say, Brother Bone, when you say that? Because then, then, then he says, and do my prophet. That's where us preachers come in. They're not about to touch him. Touch not mine anointed. <laughs> That's everybody, including the prophet. And they said, hey, don't harm the preacher. <laughs> Too many times we just don't care for each other the way we should care for each other. We work off our own agendas instead of God's agenda. We let personal vindictiveness come into our spirits and it begins to creep into the church body and we've got to get away from that church god's got a plan and he wants us to fulfill the plan and he knows how he wants the plan done and he knows when it will take place amen but we've got to get on board with god's plan you see when you fulfill your part of the plan you'll feel rewarded You know, I'm in the will of God. There's satisfaction. When you submit to the will of the plan. I'm sure Brother Staines didn't. He, he told me, he said, no, I didn't come here to be a youth pastor. I just want to be a saint. Well, no, no. You're part of the plan. You got to be part of the plan. So you got to hang out with young people. you got to do youth fundraisers. Because you care for them young people. And you want to see them go places and do things. And So you're going to sacrifice your Saturdays and, you know, some, some evenings, Friday evenings, when you could be hanging out with your family. You're just going to get your family involved in all, all this church stuff and you're going to invest your life into... Why? Because it's part of the plan. And when you know you're a part of the plan, then you have no problems wondering... Amen. If I'm in the will of God or not. Hello? My, my, my. When you're, when you're in the plan, you don't have to worry about am I in the will of God or not. 
I've told the church numerous times, I know I'm in the will of God. I'm fulfilling my part of the plan. Hallelujah. And you know what? When people get disgruntled or they're like, well, you know, I'm just not satisfied with this. You need to find your place in the plan. You need to find where you're going to operate in the plan. Amen. Too many times people say, well, I want to be a part of the plan. And God says, well, I want you to do this. And they say, oh, I don't want to do that. I mean, you think everybody wants to be the high priest. He gets to go behind the veil. He gets to go in the holiest of holies. I want to be the high priest. Who wouldn't? No, I, I want to be the one that breaks the bread. Very rarely do you find the priest over here saying, Hey, can I be the guy that takes all the carcasses out? Can I be the guy that gets all bloody and nasty? But his job was just as important as the high priest's job. His job was just as important as the one working the bread table. His job was just as important as any other job in the tabernacle. I'm trying to tell you something this morning. It may seem like a job that doesn't get you any glory. It may seem like a job that's insignificant. It may seem like a job that's nasty and dirty. But I promise you in the kingdom of God, it's just as important as me standing behind a pulpit this morning preaching the word of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 So many times we worry about what the Lord has in store for us. But can I tell you that the Lord has a plan for you today? The Lord has a purpose for you today. Jeremiah 29 and 1. Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders which were carried away captives and to the priest and to the prophets and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. Jeremiah wrote letters to individuals who had been taken away. The elders, those that were of the priesthood, the prophets. Going to verse 4 of Jeremiah, the 29th chapter. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Build ye houses, and dwell in them, and plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives, and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may be increased there, and not diminished. What's he saying? You're in a captive situation, but I want you to build I want you to multiply. I want you to prosper in the midst of an enemy. Don't be diminished, but be increased, he says. Seek the peace of the city, whether I have caused you to be carried away captives. And pray to the Lord for it, for in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you. Neither hearken to your dreams which he calls to be dreamed for they prophesy falsely unto you in my name I have not sent them saith the Lord for thus saith the Lord that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon I will visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place God has a plan you say well brother Bumgarner it seems like I'm a captive in a foreign land Seems like all the things in my life are turned upside down. People have come in and, amen, they have prophesied and they've spoken. But I'm telling somebody today, you better start listening to the voice of the Lord. And you better stop listening to the voice of an enemy and the false prophets. I know it's tense this morning. I know it's tight. But I know I'm in the will of God. You see, I understand today that Amen. It's easy to get deceived in the hour that we're living in. 
There's all kinds of winds of doctrines. There's all kinds of things being said. There's all kinds of things being taught. But you better stay within the plan. Hallelujah! You better stay in the book. If somebody comes trying to teach you a doctrine that's not based in the Word of God, you need to turn away from them. Amen. If all they can cite is some book that they read, you need to turn away from them. I'm pastoring this morning. You need to hear me. Sound doctrine is built upon the Word of God. God has a plan. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. God doesn't think evil thoughts towards us. God doesn't want to hurt us. He wants to love us. He wants to keep us. He wants to strengthen us. He loved us enough to save us even when we weren't savable. See, the Lord knows where you're at today. He knows what plans He has for you. And it's your job to say, Lord, what part of the plan do I need to fulfill? What part of the plan do I need to make happen, Lord? See, I believe the Lord, when, when a church grows, church grows when people grow. And people grow when they find their place in God's plan. When you find where you're supposed to be, you begin to grow. And as you grow, it begins to affect others, and they begin to grow. And the church body begins to grow. Why? Because I'm in the will of God. I'm in the plan of God. We're working together. Now, some of you, if you've ever been part of a job site, if you've ever had to work, if people don't work together, things don't get done. There's nothing more frustrating than having to work with 10 or 15 people and eight people are doing their job and four of them aren't. That's when tools get thrown. Sorry, brother, because I know that's a safety issue. But... Hammers get dropped. Why? Because people get frustrated. Hello? Hello? People get frustrated, and they show up, and they're doing their part, but others are just milking the clock. Walking around with a two-by-four. Brother Thomas told a story about a job he was working there in the port. He was there for, I don't guess, a couple of months. And this one guy. I think he had some type of board or something. He just walked around the job site. He had the appearance of being busy. Anybody ever work with somebody like that? He had the appearance of being busy. You know, it can happen in the church too. You got a church full of people trying and striving to work and do a work for God together because that's what we do as a family. We're all working together for the same cause. Hallelujah. We're the ministering body. We're, we're all trying to, to encourage each other and encourage somebody new when they come in and, and that's our job because we want the hurting to come in here and we want those that need help to come in here and we want those that need I mean, a miracle in their life to come in here. Amen. And we're working together as a, as, a, as a group to do that. And we should. But there will be those that, and they're going to walk around all the time. And they're acting busy. And they got something in their hand. But they're not accomplishing anything. They're milking the clock. They show up. But they don't do anything. Don't let that be you today. Don't let that be you today. Find your place in the plan. A lot 
Life is never easy. But when you know I'm fulfilling God's plan, you can rejoice. When you know you're fulfilling God's plan, you don't complain. You know, Sister Bumgarner and I, for that the year we transitioned with Brother Fisher, we drove down here from, from Liberty, two hours, two and a half hours, through Houston, Sunday morning, Sunday night. I'd get home at 12 or 1 o'clock. I've told you this, folks. Get up at 5 o'clock the next morning, go to the office, work all day, come home and collapse. <laughs> but I didn't complain. You know why? I was in the will of God. I was part of the plan. And if that meant for me driving two hours to, to be able, I was going to drive two hours to be part of the plan. Because when you're in the will of God and you know you're in the will of God, and you're, hey man, there's just a completeness that comes with it. It doesn't matter how far you have to drive. It doesn't matter what you have to endure. I'm fulfilling God's plan and I'm happy about it. There were Sunday nights, hey amen, because you know Brother Fish and I had the deal. He preached Sunday morning, I preached Sunday nights, and we do that a lot of times. There are a lot of Sunday nights. I preach my gut out, and, well, with, not all of it, but some of it, and, and uh, I'd be tired, and you get home, and be wore out, but I was happy. It was that satisfaction of I've worked hard, but I'm happy because I know I'm doing the will of God. And you see, I'm trying to get that over to somebody this morning. You need to find your happiness, uh, not in trying to, to do this or that, but find your happiness in the will of God. Amen. And if you're reaching one soul, I read something this morning and, and didn't even realize how it would tie into this morning. But uh, there was a, a brother, a friend of mine, he said, you know, I, I visited with my niece Yesterday, she came in for a visit, and we went out to eat at a certain restaurant, and she told him, she said, you know, uh, six years ago, we sat at this table, and you taught me that Bible study, and, and you, it was here where I saw the revelation, amen, of Jesus' name, baptism, and then filling of the Holy Ghost, and it was here that God changed my life, and it was here I decided to go to church and, and get baptized in Jesus' name and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, and it was here I decided to live for God, and now she's a preacher's wife. He said over the last few weeks and months, he'd been kind of going through the mully grubs and having a pity party. Well, I guess there's nothing for me, Lord. I guess everybody else gets to have revival. Everybody else gets to, to do this or that. And he said, but God reminded me, one Bible study changed a young lady's life who's an evangelist's wife now, and they're traveling all over ministering to the needs of many. You know what? He did his part. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost moving in here. Everybody wants to be Brother Peter. Everybody wants to be the one that stands up on the day of Pentecost. But Peter would have never been in the discipleship if Andrew hadn't went and got him. Sometimes God wants you to be an Andrew. You may not be heard as much, amen, but you're still a disciple. You may not be at the top where everybody's looking at you and hearing you, but if you'll just do your part, you can transform a generation. If Andrew had not gone and gotten Peter, Somebody hear me this morning. You impact one life, but that one life may impact a generation. Amen. Andrew, if he had not gotten Peter, Peter would not have been a disciple. Peter would not have been given the keys to the kingdom. Peter would not have stood on the day of Pentecost. But because Andrew said, man, this is good stuff. Wait a second, Andrew. You go get Peter. You know how he is. He'll take all your thunder, Andrew. He's been doing it for years. That's your brother. No, that wasn't his attitude. Andrew said, i got to get to my brother. This is good stuff. This Jesus is good stuff. Peter needs this. Peter cusses like a sailor. Peter's got a bad temper. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. If Jesus can change Peter... He can change anybody. Amen. Hey, Peter, come on. We got to go see Jesus, man. 
You need some changes. <laughs> And Jesus began to work on Peter. Jesus saw some things in Peter that others didn't see. Uh, he saw a man that, you know what, uh, if I give the old boy the Holy Ghost, he's going to stand up and preach when people persecute him. When, when, if I fill Peter with the Holy Ghost, he's going to change the world. You know what, if I can just be an Andrew, if I can just reach that one that can turn the world upside down, find yourself a place in the plan. You know the Lord loved you so much that he created a plan that wouldn't exclude you, but it would include you so that you could be a part of the kingdom of God. That's a fascinating thought, isn't it? There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, John the third chapter. A ruler of the Jews. And the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Amen. He, he's given a plan. He's saying you've got to be born of water and of spirit to be born again. He's given a plan. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh and whether it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the spirit. Can I get a witness to that today? You were seeking the Lord, you were crying out, and all of a sudden you begin to feel it. Something move all over you. Some said it feels like fire from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. Others said, man, it came across like a cool wind. But when you felt it, you didn't know where it come from. All you know that it came in. You don't know where it went, to, but you know when it left, I have been filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, too many times, we stop right there when we're talking about being born again. When we talk about God's plan. But let's read a little bit further. Nicodemus answered and said unto them, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel? And knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and we receive not our witness. If I had told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. For whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus begins to explain the plan. He references back to Moses the plague of the serpents. When they're in the wilderness, the Lord says, you need to raise up a serpent. And everybody that looks on it won't die. And just like that serpent was raised up, so must the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, be lifted up. And all mankind, look. he says, I'm giving you a plan. You've got to look to Jesus. That's the plan. Look to Jesus. 
Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. You got to be born of water and of spirit. But in it all, you got to look to Jesus. What did he say? He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name. Everybody say the name. See, Jesus just changed it right there. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name. There is power in the name of Jesus. Amen. There's a reason why we baptize in Jesus' name. It's not a title. It is a name. We believe on the name. Amen. I understand there's a father. I understand there's a son. And I understand there's Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Colossians 2 and 9 says, The fullness of the Godhead dwells in him bodily everything is identified by the name jesus said i come in my father's name i don't know why i'm getting off on this this morning but it's good truth hallelujah so he said about his name of the only begotten son of god and this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds evil you ever think about how wickedness loves darkness somebody said bro why are you putting all these lights on here around the church because thieves don't like light they like darkness they like to sneak in take things from you and sneak out they like to hide that's not part of God's plan but those that love truth love the light for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light neither cometh to the light lest his deeds should be reproved You know, it's an amazing thing when light begins to get shed on some things. You begin to see things. Because in darkness, all you can see is shadows. Even in, in the morning light when the sun's just coming out. Don't pull that trigger. Do you know for sure what it is? It may be a big buck, but it may not be. You, got, you can't pull the trigger yet. You got to wait till you see it, whether it's a buck or not. Is that right, Brother Webb? You can see the shadows moving, but you don't know what it is. That's part of the problem with a lot of things. People see shadows, and they think they know what's going on, but they're trying to make decisions in the dark, not in the light. You got to be careful, amen, what decisions you make when you don't have a complete understanding. Oh, I hope somebody's getting this this morning. Sometimes you just need to wait till the light's revealed before you make up your mind on something. Because if you make a decision when your understanding's clouded, darkened, you may make the wrong decision. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. When you make a decision in the light, you have a full understanding. You know exactly everything in the perimeters. It's not darkened. There's no shadow. And yet I tell you today, if your desire is to fulfill the truth of the Lord and fulfill His plan, then it's time to stop playing hide and seek with sin.
Lord, reveal it. Reveal it in me. Your will, your way, whatever your plan is for me, I'm willing to follow you completely. You have to excuse my voice, but I'm trying to talk to somebody today. God's got a plan for you. You don't have to manipulate plan. You don't have to force plan. You don't have to try to make plan happen for you. If you will just submit yourself to the will of God, then God in His season will put you where He wants you to fulfill His will in His way. When we try to force it, when you try to force it, you will fail. Brother Staines, we learned a valuable lesson from your father. Now, I've only know about it because I heard about it. But Brother Staines taught us all a lesson, didn't he, brother? He taught us that you cannot get a four by eight sheet of, of sheetrock through a three foot door. It doesn't matter how angry you get. It may have been in pieces. That's the problem. When you start trying to force things, the things that God wants to be whole get broken. When you try to force things, see, I can just picture, because I've been on job sites trying to make something work. Get so mad, I Christian cuss. Now, look, look at y'all, Agnos Sanctimonious. I mean, I, I probably said cotton picking four times in a row. Cotton picking, cotton picking, cotton picking. You work on a project, eight bolts will come loose and the ninth one won't. And you get upset, you get frustrated. And it's the same in living for God and His plan. If it's not happening as fast as you think it should. I'll make it happen. And when you make things happen, things get destroyed. And you've got to understand this. The decisions you make don't just affect you, but they affect your family. They affect your children. They affect your friends. They affect your witness. So what do we do, Lord? Help me make the right decision in the life. Help me not to force your will, your plan, but help me to be submitted. Sometimes the plan of God is for you to wait. Sometimes the will of God is for you to just be still. Sometimes it's the will of God for you to just pray. One of the most powerful offices in the church is the prayer warrior. But prayer is not easy. Prayer is self-denial. Prayer is, you know, it, it, it's not glorified. Prayer is in a corner, in a closet somewhere. Just you and the Lord and nobody's seeing you do it. And nobody's patting you on the back. But uh, you know, you're making impact in the kingdom of God because you're tearing down strongholds in the spirit world and you're demolishing what the enemy's trying to do to the church. You're praying hedges of protection around the body of Christ. You're praying hedges of protection around your pastor. And I promise you, I know you pray for me. And I thank you because there are times when I feel the burden and yet there is such a peace. I cannot explain it. How can I be going, dealing with all this turmoil, but yet I'm at peace? Why? Because there's a grandma somewhere. It one of my dear sister, Grandma Blue Hairs, as Frank calls her. She's in her prayer closet, and she's praying, Lord, cover my pastor. Keep my pastor, Lord. What are you doing? That's your part of the plan. That's your part of the plan. Hebrews 11, or excuse me, Hebrews 12 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin 
which just so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, you're going to have some tough days. But when you realize that the Lord has a plan for my life. And if Jesus could fulfill the plan that the Father had for him. Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. You see, he said, I don't like this part of the plan. I like the part of the plan where I was walking amongst people and I was opening blinded eyes and I was cleansing leprosy. And I was causing the dead to... I like that part of the plan. But this is the rough part of the plan. But nevertheless, it's part of the plan, Lord. Not my will. Your will be done. Jesus, if, if you can fulfill the plan of the Father, then I want to lay aside the weight. The things that so easily beset us. The things that keep me from completely fulfilling the will of God in my life. Because I'm holding on to the things of the world more than I am the things of God. I want to be able to say, Lord, I'm in your plan. Whatever you have for me. One of the scariest things you can do is tell God you won't do something. But when I submit to the will of the Father. When I submit to the plan. Why? Because there are those who've gone on before. And if they could make the sacrifice and say yes to the will of God in their life, then how much more should we, who have been blessed to a greater degree, We're not having to get up at 4.30 in the morning to come make donuts to pay the light bill. We're not having to get up, you know, and pray and seek. God's blessed us. He's blessed us because of what they did. He's blessed us because of their efforts. All they were doing was saying, Lord, we want to be a part of the plan. We want to do our part. Whatever your will is, Lord. I mean, they could have got an attitude. Sister Patterson could have got an attitude. Well, I'm a banker. I work at a bank. I'm not going to get up and make no donuts just to pay for that church. That wasn't her spirit. Her spirit was, I'm going to be a part of the plan. I'm going to do my part for the kingdom of God. And if that requires me making donuts, I'm going to make donuts. If that means I'm making peanut brittle, I'm going to make peanut brittle. Hello? Some of them preachers got on our little forum and said, what, some of you guys are Bible binders and pulpit builders and, and what other, you know, what other curricular activities y'all good at? And I put on there, I'm a professional peanut brittle maker. Using only the best ingredients. That's comical. But if it takes making peanut brittle to get it done, I'll make peanut brittle. If it takes cleaning the bathrooms, I'll clean the bathrooms. If it takes putting a roof on, I'll put a roof on. Whatever it takes, Lord, I just want to be a part of the plan. They did it. They didn't complain about it. They just did it. 
We got to get a hold of that, folks. We got to be a part of God's plan. Lord, I want you to fulfill in me that which you have started. Uh, hallelujah. The way we start to execute a plan is to realize the designer has made it so we can accomplish it. Uh, God gave us, uh, amen, a job to do, and he has given us the ability to do it. There is no reason, amen, we cannot accomplish, uh, amen, God's plan for this church. Philippians 1 and 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Are you hearing your pastor this morning? Are you hearing this preacher this morning? God didn't save you for you to just sit there and be purposeless. He saved you to be a part of the plan. He saved you, amen, to fulfill something in this church. But you got to say, am I willing to do my part? Am I willing to make the sacrifice? Am I willing to humble myself? Hebrews 13 and 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. What did Paul say? Make you perfect in every good work to do His will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. What, what are you doing to me, Lord? That good work to do your will, Lord? That I can be well-pleasing in your sight. Word of God says, and I'm coming to a close. But it doesn't say, well done, thy good and faithful pastor. It doesn't say, well done, thy good and faithful youth pastor. Children's ministry director, prayer coordinator, music minister. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. And if you want to be a leader in the kingdom of God, you've got to learn to be servant to all. You've got to get a servant's mentality. You know what that means? If I can serve you. You know why people don't like foot washings, Brother Staines? It's demeaning. It's humbling. Peter, I'm going to wash your feet. You ain't washing my feet, boy. Right. If I don't wash you, not just my feet, Lord, wash all of me. You see, when you're a servant, you don't mind washing somebody else's feet. And if you really have a right spirit, you don't have a problem letting somebody wash your feet. But we've become sophisticated in 2015, you know. I call a foot wash and half the church don't show up. That tells me we got a pride issue. Say it like you want to, but that's a pride issue. But when I can humble myself, I'm going to tell you something, one of the most precious things that I have done since I've been here. I've baptized several folks Helped build some things around here. We've done some great things. But one of the most precious moments to me was when we had foot washing. And us men went to the back. And I got to bend down. Help Brother Fisher take his shoes off. Get down on my knees to that old elder. And wash his feet. 
I was fulfilling my part of the plan. As Joshua was to Moses, I was washing his feet. And you see, when I get it in my spirit, Lord, whatever your plan is for my life, I want to fulfill it as a servant. A servant doesn't have to be in charge. A servant doesn't have to be the boss. He just has to be willing to serve. Willing to serve. And when I say, Lord, whatever your plan is for my life, I'll do it. That means going and picking somebody up that doesn't smell good, doesn't look good, and bringing them to church. I'll do it, Lord. I don't care what anybody says. I'm just being a servant, Lord. To you be the glory. Can we stand to our feet this morning? There's such a sweet presence of the Lord that has moved into this room. I feel like the Lord's talking to somebody. Will you? Will you be a part of my plan today? Will you be a part of my kingdom today as, as it is here upon this earth? Or will you sit back and let somebody else do the work? open the altars today to your church I'm open these altars because I want you to come search your heart am I really doing everything I'm supposed to be doing at Peace Tabernacle